Hello again. For anybody who missed the last talk and is just tuning in for this talk, my name is Matt Cornis. I'm a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the Green Bay Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office. I work with the Great Lakes Tagging and Recovery Lab, also called the Mass Marketing Program. And in this presentation, I'll be focusing on steelhead results from 2021. So first, I'm going to show this figure again from my last talk. It's showing the number of uh, fish marked in millions by year. I want to note that these pink bars are the steelhead. So marking and coated wire tagging of steelhead began with the 2017 year class. Um, and uh, obviously with the 2020 pandemic year, we missed tagging a year class and also missed a, a recovery year for some of these earlier year classes. So uh, 2021 really marks the first opportunity for us to look at many of these fish, including the first data on the 2018 and 19 year classes and providing more substantial data on the 2017 year class. This is because we typically start seeing steelhead return at age two uh, with a greater amount uh, of steelhead returning at ages three and four for these tag lots. So with the 2021 field season complete, we can start trying to take a look at the questions that were of interest to fishery managers when the steelhead coated wire tagging study was first designed. Uh, chief among these are to estimate wild steelhead production by year class, to evaluate steelhead movement patterns, and to evaluate relative survival measures uh, based on various factors like stocking location and strain. I want to note that all of the data in this talk are corrected for sampling effort and stocking numbers as appropriate, but I can't stress enough that all results are preliminary. Um, this is due to a couple of reasons. First, a number of the computations depend on the uh, angler harvest hour data, and I, I just received those in my inbox this morning, so was not able to update those analyses. Other analyses depend on the aging of wild fish, and while our lab is probably two-thirds of the way through the wild steelhead scales from 2021, um, that's not complete yet either. And then from a bigger picture standpoint, when this study was designed, um, we sought to collect data across multiple years from multiple year classes, and this presentation represents the results from a single field year by and large. So um, regardless of those other issues, uh, we are not drawing final conclusions today. So first, I want to talk about our wild production estimates. Uh, because we do this on the year class specific level, um, this is depending on having ages for our steelhead. And many, but not all, of the steelhead in our data set are aged. So um, to fix this, we used lengths at age from coated wire tag steelhead in 2021 to determine the proportion of unaged fish in each length bend that were age two from the 2019 year class and age three from the 2018 year class. We also used the 2021 lengths at age for the 2019 data for the 2017 year class at age two because in 2019, there were not known aged fish from older ages. This uh, results in a couple of critical assumptions for our estimates of wild production. First, we are assuming similar lengths at age for wild and hatchery fish. Uh, this is probably not the case if Chinook salmon are any indication. Um, so that's something to bear in mind as we go through this, and that'll be updated as we complete our aging of the wild fish from 2021. We are also assuming that the length proportions from 2021 are applicable to fish caught in 2019. And we know from Chinook salmon, there tends to be interannual inter variability, inter variability in length at age. So unfortunately, we do see a difference in the length at age two fish in 2021 and 2019. This is a length frequency histogram where we have count on the y-axis and length bin on the x-axis. The known age two fish from 2019 are in black and the known age two fish from 2021 are in red. Um, so we do see greater lengths at age two in 2021 than 2019. This is uh, pretty, pretty normal to see this kind of variability. And we decided to correct this when we did our proportions um, for estimating the age of unaged fish. Essentially, we assumed that there was higher lengths at age in 2021 than 2019, and thus we slid the length distribution back by one inch. Um, that's the figure you see below, and you can see there's much better alignment between the red and the black bars. And thus we use the adjusted 2021 length proportions for the 2019 data when making our estimates of wild production. So just a few more assumptions to go over before we get into the results. Um, first, we assumed that there was minimal length overlap between H3 and H5 steelhead. This is because H3 was the oldest fish we used for uh, estimating wild uh, production by year class, and H5 is the youngest age fish for which we don't have 
known age data to inform our length proportions. This seems like a pretty reasonable assumption to me. Um, also, we assumed minimal recovery of age one fish, something well supported by our data. We only recovered five age one steelhead from 2019 through 2021, compared to 205 known age two steelhead over that same time span. We're also assuming a mixed population from May through August when our samples are collected. And then perhaps the biggest one on this particular list is that we are assuming no net movement between Lakes Huron and Michigan. Um, as many folks here know, we have observed a unidirectional movement for Chinook salmon from Lake Huron into Lake Michigan over the past several years. Um, we don't seem to be seeing that with steelhead. However, we don't have a ton of data either. So just to show you what we do have in 2021, all eight of the coated wire tag steelhead recovered in Lake Huron were in fact stocked in Lake Michigan. That shows some movement from Michigan into Huron. But don't worry folks, Huron sent them back. Um, we recovered all eight of the coated wire tag steelhead that were stocked in Lake Huron were recovered in Lake Michigan in 2021. So essentially in our data, the two lakes swapped eight fish. Um, and so an assumption of no net movement is appropriate for these preliminary estimates. So here are those preliminary estimates. The overall percent wild values in Lake Michigan were 45% for the 2017 year class, 40% for the 2018 year class, and 33% for the 2019 year class. Um, so we're looking at somewhere between a third and just under a half of the observations being wild fish. These values are very consistent with the Odalith microchemistry results that classified about 40% of observations as wild fish. This is from Breaker et al. in prep. It's also consistent with some unpublished data from Michigan that Breaker cited in that paper, um, citing uh, 30 to 50 percent wild steelhead production um, from the mid 90s. So uh, these values are right about where we thought we would end up. So when we use a ratio uh, with the known number of stocked fish and those percentages of wild fish from each year class, we can come up with this figure, which shows the estimated number of steelhead smolts in millions by year class. Um, and uh, we can see that at least for these three year classes, production was pretty consistent um, with a, a peak of 1.6 million wild fish in the 2017 year class and a, a low point of 1.0 million wild fish in the 2019 year class. So based on these preliminary estimates, we were estimating between 3 and 3.6 million steelhead entering the lake uh, for each of these three year classes. I would say that based on what we've seen for Chinook salmon, I would expect much more interannual variability the more year classes we are able to evaluate with these tags. Next, I want to move to our preliminary assessment of steelhead movement. To look at movement, we multiplied the proportion of catch per effort of steelhead from each tag lot by straight line distance between stocking and recovery unit. So the tag lot is the unit of replication here. For each tag lot, we know the stocking location, and then from the recoveries, we know where each individual fish is recovered. Um, this gives us a rough sense of movement. And so for steelhead, we had an average in Lake Michigan of 158 kilometers of straight line distance between stocking and recovery location, uh, plus or minus 99 kilometers for standard deviation. So you can see there's a bit of variability there around that mean. Uh, for reference, Chinook salmon had an average of 135 kilometers, plus or minus 78. And granted, that was not done with an effort correction, but these uh, data are giving us every indication that steelhead move much more similarly to Chinook salmon uh, in the sense that they appear to be kind of moving all around the lake after stocking. So to kind of explore some of that variability around the mean, I put together this figure. Uh, this is showing the straight line distance in kilometers between stocking and recovery location for all of the various tag lot stocking locations. Um, the average value is this red dashed line and so we can see, uh, you know, kind of natural variation around that mean. A few of the outliers to point out here is that the eight fish from Lake Huron had uh, the highest amount of movement. That's not much of a surprise, especially when you consider that all eight of those fish were recovered in Lake Michigan. Um, what was kind of a little bit of a surprise is that the fish stocked in MM1, 2, and 3 appeared to have much less straight line movement. Granted, we're talking about 10 fish. These, these little numbers above each bar are the number of recoveries um, for that stocking location. So that gives you some measure of confidence there. Um, so the big take home from this is that uh, we believe steelhead are moving much more like a Chinook salmon than something like a lake trout. 
Another way of looking at this that's uh, perhaps more useful to managers is to look at the proportion of steelhead um, that were recovered in the stocking unit. Uh, you know, a question of where are the fish we're stocking being recovered. And so uh, on average, only 14% of the catch per effort occurred in the unit where the fish were stocked. Um, obviously, we see an outlier here for Northern Lake Michigan, where a large portion, over 90% of those, were recovered um, in that stocking area. Um, and then we have uh, some fish from Wisconsin being a little bit higher, it looks like 30 and 50% um, from some of these Wisconsin stocking locations. But on the whole, um, much like Chinook salmon, where a fish was stocked doesn't really affect where that steelhead was recovered. Another way of looking at this was to look at the CPE that occurred both within the stocking unit or adjacent stocking units. And uh, in this case, we still see a pretty low number, an average of 28% of that catch per effort occurring in the stocking or adjacent units. Um, again, this is the proportion and these are the stocking um, locations with this average value. Uh, we see some high points here again in Northern Lake Michigan. Most of those fish are being recovered in or near where they were stocked. Um, and then Wisconsin stocked steelhead we're seeing a, a fair bit there as well, and then much less for Michigan, Indiana, um, and Illinois. Uh, part of this could just be um, the amount of survival we're seeing from these fish. Um, we'll get to that in the next section, but um, we do have more fish surviving and, and therefore more observations from Indiana and from these Michigan plants uh, overall. I also have a series of maps here that are going to help us visualize what this movement looks like for steelhead stocked in Lake Michigan. Um, in each of these maps, you're going to see steelhead that are stocked in a given district. This particular map is showing steelhead that were stocked in Indiana. And then these circles represent the um, proportion of CPE that occurred in these various areas of the lake. So uh, basically, the larger the circle, the, the greater amount of CPE um, farm fish that were stocked in Indiana. And so we can see that these Indiana stocked steelhead are being recovered lake-wide, uh, particularly in, in northwestern Lake Michigan, but uh, really we're seeing circles everywhere and a relatively small circle here in the home unit of Indiana. This next map is showing steelhead stocked in MM7, where this red arrow is pointing. And once again, we can see a relatively small circle here indicating that not many of those steelhead were recovered in MM7. Um, and in fact, there was a pretty broad distribution of where those steelhead were recovered lake-wide. One last example, here we're looking at steelhead stocked in MM8, and this map is, is more or less the same where we see circles all over the lake. And in fact, the largest circles appear to be in northwestern Lake Michigan and in Indiana, in terms of where we're seeing the largest proportion of the catch per effort of fish stocked in MM8. So we did try to evaluate differences in movement by genetic strain. This figure is showing the average distance moved in kilometers for the various strains. Um, we have R. Lee, Chambers Creek, Ganaraska, Michigan strain, Skamania strain, and then one tag lot that was applied to both Michigan and Skamania strain. Um, the sample sizes you hear, this is the number of uh, tag lots for each of these strains. Uh, a really important thing to note here is that most stocking units only had one or two strains. So this is a very confounded figure. We're not really able to disentangle the effects of strain from the effects of stocking location. The one possible exception to that was in Indiana. We appeared to have enough tag lots to perhaps have a meaningful analysis. Uh, we had six tag lots and 21 fish from Michigan strain and 13 tag lots and 144 fish from Skamania strain stocked in Indiana where we can control for stocking location. And in this case, we did find a significant difference with a greater average distance moved for Skamania than for Michigan, um, assuming unequal variances in that assessment. So uh, it remains to be seen whether this pattern will hold with data from future years. Finally, I want to talk about relative survival of steelhead across various factors of interest to fishery managers. First, we're going to talk about relative survival by jurisdiction. I did break this down by year class so we can see what kind of consistency or lack thereof we have among year classes. Um, I just have relative survival on the y-axis. This is an index value that is basically our catch per effort uh, corrected for the number of fish stocked in, for each tag lot. 
And so for the 2017 year class, um, looking at yearlings only for all of these, um, we see a relatively uh, higher amount of survival for fish stocked in Indiana than Michigan or Wisconsin with one outlier point here with pretty good survival for Michigan. For the 2018 year class, we see a similar pattern with uh, overall higher median relative survival for Indiana stocked fish than Michigan or Wisconsin, but I will note that uh, both of these states, in fact, all three of these jurisdictions have a much wider box for the 2018 year class, um, indicating that there was a lot more variability in relative survival by tag lot. And we can see here for Wisconsin, there was uh, one tag lot here that had pretty good survival. The 2019 year class had very similar patterns to the 2018 year class, higher relative survival for Indiana, but pretty decent survival here for both Michigan and Wisconsin as well, especially when you consider the, the um, box and the whisker for these jurisdictions. This figure just drives home the overall patterns, looking at relative survival for the 2017 through 19 year classes combined, um, where we see that uh, pattern of higher relative survival from Indiana persist, but we do see uh, relatively good survival from at least some tag lots in Michigan and Wisconsin. Obviously, the jurisdictions of Michigan and Wisconsin include more statistical districts in them than the Indiana jurisdiction. And so to provide a little more detail, I broke down the relative survival values by the stocking locations from each tag lot. And to pull out some general patterns here, uh, I'm going to look at the median bars um, for those areas where we had, uh, you know, a number of tag lots. So these yellow highlighted areas are where we saw relatively high median survival. This includes Indiana. Grand Traverse Bay, um, southeastern Michigan waters in MM7, and southwestern Wisconsin waters, WM5 and 6. These red bars are where we saw relatively low survival. These include kind of central Michigan waters of MM5 and 6, and then kind of northwestern areas from WM3 and WM4. And then finally, I want to highlight MM8 and the Wisconsin small tributaries. Um, these just had a lot of variation in terms of their relative survival. Some of the tag lots did really well. Uh, others of those tag lots did not do so well. And as a result, we have these kind of really broad bars, um, even though we have relatively low medians, uh, indicating success in these areas for at least a few of the tag lots. Stocking location isn't the only factor that could affect survival. Um, if we start with life stage, there's really no surprises here. This is relative survival of fingerlings, fall fingerlings, summer fingerlings, and yearlings, um, where we see a very clear and obvious difference with higher relative survival for yearlings, which is supportive of many other studies on both steelhead and other salmonines in the Great Lakes. Finally, we looked at the total length of stocking here on the x-axis as a potential factor for relative survival. Um, it does look like there's the potential for a threshold response here. Um, fish that are kind of less than the 140 to 150 millimeters by and large had low survival. Um, there were a, a handful of exceptions to this, but once we get above 150, even though we do have a number of tag lots that don't have great survival, we do also see a number of tag lots with much better survival. Um, so total length of stocking could be playing a role here. If we break this down by state, we don't see any clear patterns. Um, uh, Lake Huron in gray, Illinois in green, Indiana in purple, Michigan in blue, and Wisconsin in orange. Um, it kind of looks like, uh, you know, on the whole, uh, we see Wisconsin fish in this window from about 140 to about 160, with a lot more variability for Michigan and Indiana. I broke this down by strain as well, um, but it's a, a total scattershot, uh, not really much to draw here. Um, the grays here are Arlees, the greens are Chamber Creeks, the purples are Ganaraska, uh, the blues are Michigan, and the yellows are Skimania. Um, so we're not really seeing an effect of jurisdiction or strain for this length of stocking relationship. Um, one potential hypothesis here is that fish that are stocked at a smaller size uh, try to oversummer in their stocking streams, and if the summer habitat is not uh, good enough quality in terms of temperature, that could result in a lower relative survival. So some conclusions today. The preliminary results suggest that steelhead have dispersal similar to Chinook salmon, that they appear to be in the ballpark of 30 to 45 percent wild, which is translated into 1 to 1.6 million wild smolts per year class. 
um, that steelhead appear to have focal points of relative survival from multiple stocking locations around the lake, and that they potentially have higher relative survival when stocked as yearlings and at sizes roughly uh, larger than 150 millimeters. The values and conclusions in this presentation may change once data are updated um, and as data from additional year classes become available. With that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and take questions if there's time.